Right after he did not follow, he did not get the end of the team. Thank you all. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to our Friday night Bible study with the Straightway Church of Christ, 37 Market Street in the city of New Haven, Connecticut. I'm Bishop Emeril McCoy, your servant shepherd, and I have the pleasure of being the teacher on tonight. We're in the book of Isaiah, chapter 34. Our Bible reading for today was Isaiah chapter 34 to 39, and we're just going to uh, stay with chapter number 34, talking about the indignation, the sword, and the book of the Lord. Three focuses, indignation, sword, and book. Let's get right into our lesson on today, Isaiah 34 and verse number one. The Bible says, come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people, let the earth hear. And all that is Therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, as the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll. All their hosts shall fall, as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. You see here, God's judgment on Assyria expanded to a larger prophecy in which Isaiah looked ahead and describes God's ultimate day of wrath and judgment on all nations. Isaiah is referred to as the eagle eye prophet because God gave him a prophetic vision to see far beyond his years. And this is one of the scriptures that when we study um, the art and science of biblical interpretation, we realize that it has a double mention, understanding, or revelation. Yes, it was to the Assyrians. Yes, what it was said had a meaning for them, but Isaiah also was prophesying at a time that would be after the church's rapture and during the tribulation period. See, the universal nature of this judgment is clear. The Lord is angry with all the nations, furious with all their armies. The problem is that they have opposed God and his people filling up the cup of God's righteous wrath to be poured out in fury against them, them doing the last great rebellion against heaven. There's one thing you need to understand, that God does have indignation. And with his indignation, he brings a sword. And with the sword, he brings the book. The book of the Lord is a righteous book. It's one thing about God. You can't get by him. And whatever is right, God will repay. See, the reference to the stars in the sky may be literal, in which case 
Isaiah could be describing the eternal state following the millennium. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 23, the Bible says the new Jerusalem does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the lamb. See, it's also possible that Isaiah was speaking metaphorically of worldly leaders whose powers will be stripped. Christ returns to defeat Satan and to establish his kingdom. Yes, amen, tribulation is a part of God's assignment. But you remember now, the church has been raptured, which is spiritual Israel. But natural Israel is still given an opportunity to be saved. They rejected Jesus. And uh, in that they rejected him, he blinded them. And now he's given them an opportunity after the church has been raptured away to come on in. And those who reject him will suffer his wrath. His wrath will come in the form of indignation. His wrath will come in the form of a sword. His wrath will come in the form of the book of the Lord. You need to realize God is keeping a good record. He's keeping a good account. And you want to make sure that you are on the right side of the ledger. Thank God for the word that God has given to Isaiah to remind us we got to be ready when he comes. This message is for all people of the world. Isaiah is speaking this as a warning to the inhabitants of the earth. The time for this prophecy could be any time from the time it was spoken until now. This to me is speaking of judgment and punishment from God on a people who have no intention of following him. They try to settle their grievances with war. They place their trust in their armies instead of God. This speaks of a great destruction of the enemies of God and his people. In Ezekiel chapter 39, we read of such a battle where five-sixths of Gog in the land of Magog will be destroyed. There will be so many dead, it will take seven months to bury them. The blood will run to the horse's bridle in this great destruction. And I know, amen, there are many people who look at the scripture and do not believe that the word of God is true. But I want you to know ain't but one way to God. There's one Lord, there's one faith and one baptism. And this scripture that we embrace reminds us that God is a just God. We're talking about indignation. We're talking about the sword. We're talking about the book of the Lord. Now, I just want you to open your imagination. Just think a few months ago, 12 or 13 months ago, how many folk were dying from this worldwide pandemic to the point that the funeral homes didn't even have places to put the bodies. When the hospitals, the morgues, would be just backing up refrigerator trucks, and some of those bodies were misplaced or mislabeled. But that's only an indication that when we do not glorify God. See, the text is very clear. If my people, 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, which are called by my name, just humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn away from their wicked ways. God is trying to get the church in position to do what it's supposed to do. So he allows certain conditions to happen. So we can change our position. Oh, God help us. Indignation is not the design of God for his people. But trust me, if you don't obey him, you will suffer the consequences 
of your own actions. And this is just preparing us mentally, spiritually, prophetically for what's going to happen after the church is raptured away. This type of destruction really comes from God. The stink will be so bad from this battle that people will have to put stoppers on their noses. The battle in Ezekiel is speaking of the battle of Armageddon. Look at a, sim a similar scripture in Revelation. Revelation 6 and verse number 12. The Bible says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Verse 13, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casted her untimely figs. She is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. You see, Isaiah in the verse above is prophesying something at the end of the age. This was not a prophecy of the near future. The fig tree symbolizes Israel. Excuse me. This is a time when even the powers of heaven are going to be shaken. Matthew 24 and verse 29. The Bible says immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And the stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. See, this is going to be a time when mankind will not be able to trust in the material world he sees. Men's heart will fail them for the things that they see. Luke 21 and 26, supporting scripture says, Men's heart failing them for fear. And looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. In other words, what we're going through now is just preparing us to understand. You don't want to experience the indignation of God. You don't want to experience the sword of the Lord. You don't want to experience the book of the Lord. But he's given us a glimpse. <laughs> So that we can change our position. Because some of us are in the wrong place. So he touches our condition. Praying that we change our position. Come on up a little bit higher. Realize that it's not God's will that any should perish. Realize that God has not appointed us to obtain his wrath. Realize that God is not some narcissistic deity that's just waiting for you to mess up. But he's like this. My little children, sin not. So John writes. But if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father who's faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. This is not your portion. We're going to be raptured away. We're going to be taken away. We're going to be carried away. But if we don't heed the warnings, if we don't make our calling and election sure, the same God that died for your sins is going to judge you harshly. Why? Because this is the indignation of the Lord. This is the sword of the Lord. This is the book of the Lord. Isaiah 34 and verse number 5, the Bible said, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse out to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood, it's made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats 
with the fat of kidneys of rams, for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls. The land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fat. You see, Edom was an example of the ungodly nations that God would judge and destroy. The Edomites, Edomites, excuse me, were Israel's relatives, descendants of Jacob's twin brother called Esau. And remember when the Lord told Rebecca, there are two nations in your womb. Warring and the biblical narrative lets us know that Jacob and Esau always had issues. And until this day, they still have issues. And on tomorrow, they will have issues. Because Edom is an example of an ungodly nation. But how can you be called ungodly when you have a man connection with God? Because you choose to be ungodly. These are not heathens. These are not those who don't know have never had an opportunity. This is somebody that when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God. Can y'all see the indignation? But became vain in their imaginations. The problem is not with the sinners in the world. The problem is with the sinners in the church. Yeah. Because you won't even acknowledge that what you're doing is wrong. And you think you're just going to live off of the mercy and grace of God and don't have to give an account. Church at Galatia, they had a problem with that. There's the meaning of law and grace. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What kind of thought is that? The more I sin, the more God going to forgive me. You don't change your behavior. You don't change your motives. All you do is keep doing the same thing and then say, well, God loves me so much, he's going to forgive you. No, I come to remind you there is a God of indignation. There's a God who carries a sword. And there's a God that has the book of the law. Here they are held up as an example of nations that forgot God. The New Testament similarly use Esau as an example of a godless person in order to warn believers. Please hear the warning. Hebrews 12 and 16. Lest there be any fornicator, I hope I'm warning you, or profane person. That means you got that cussing problem. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, did not value the sovereign election of God. He chose you for this. But you don't want it. And you give it away. You're going to experience the indignation of the Lord. Isaiah described Edom's judgment as a sacrifice. God's holy word. It is very important to see that this judgment comes from God. Edomia is the land of Edom. You remember from earlier studies in Genesis that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup? This is this in verse 5 is judgment against his descendants. Ouch. The people of God's curse is speaking of those who disobey God. It is for those who totally reject Jesus as their Savior. Notice also the sword of judgment is clean. It is righteous judgment. Basra, in a specific place, is Edom. This is speaking of the judgment of God as a sacrifice to him. Now, there are many people that don't understand when we talk about God's righteous judgment and those who are in a certain family being cursed. But the best way I can make you understand it, it's not natural. Esau was representative of those who spiritually reject God. See, he's, he's talking about those in the Old Testament, but it's revealed in the New Testament 
that God will turn you over to a reprobate mind. A, a sinner man can't be turned over to a reprobate mind. This is somebody who knows God, who has a clear understanding of their birthright and reject God for a bowl of soup. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm just trying to warn you of the indignation, the sword, and the book of the law. See, this great judgment is like a sacrifice to God. These people in their rejection of God had denied him and his sacrifice. The blood, fatness, kidneys are all God's portion of the sacrifice. Unicorns are wild bulls in this particular instance. So much blood is shed here that it appears that the blood soaks the land. Isaiah 34 and verse number 8. For it is a day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. You're double-minded. You're unstable. Verse number nine, and the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. Verse 10, it shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. Generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Edom's destruction would be a time of paying Edom, paying back Edom for its hostility against Zion. The day of vengeance of the Lord is the same time as the wrath of the Lord, which is poured out on the wicked and unbelieving world. Notice the word year in the verse above. This shows us that the wrath would not be for a very long time. The controversy of Zion is speaking of the rejection of God's people by these evil people. Edom is spoken of specifically because they refused passage across their land to the children of Israel. God fights the battle for his people. Although the Edomites should have supported Israel on this journey through the desert from Egypt to Canaan, for instance, they turned against the Israelites and made their journey harder. God would not let such sin go unpunished. So the land of Edom was turned into a heap of burning rubble, never to be inhabited again. Edom's fate is even described in terms of a fire whose smoke will go up forever. Fire and brimstone from God rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. The word turning into pitch. And this verse above certainly indicates such a judgment on Edom. No one, and I want to stress, no one was left alive in Sodom and Gomorrah. You know the story. God sent word. I'm going to destroy this city. Abram pleaded on behalf of his family. And I'm pleading with you, family of God. It's going to rain. God is sending the judgment of fire upon this earth. It's not going to be like war. It's going to be by fire this time. Come on out of the wilderness. This indignation is not anything to play with. You're not going to be able to... Talk your way out of this one. Come on on to the Lord's side while you still have a chance. It appears that this, the same in the case here. In areas of such total destruction, there would be no reason to go there. World War II, the areas bombed by a nuclear bomb, was said to be like this for hundreds of years, or even thousands of years there would be uninhabitable. Think about that. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. Ah, you don't want to experience the indignation of God. You don't want to experience, amen, the sword of the Lord. You don't want to experience the book of the Lord when 
Uh, you on the wrong side of the ledger. God, I thank you. Thank you, Jesus. This is speaking of the area becoming a wasteland. Verse number 11, but the cormorant, cormorant, cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out it upon, stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. I like the Queen's English. The line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Such a literary power. Edom and all of this is really speaking of the ungodly world as well. Man given enough time will destroy himself and the planet. Just as Moses let the children of Israel out of Egypt, which is a type of the world or sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, is leading us out of this chaotic world. That's why I keep appealing to you. Heed the warning. Indignation is coming. The sword of the Lord is coming. The book of the Lord is coming. Come on out of that world of sin and thank God for your salvation. The 11th verse above is just describing a place where humans cannot survive. Only the scavengers of the world can make it here. They are loners living of the destruction of others. Verse number 12, they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be nothing. Thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles, nettles and brambles, excuse me, brambles in the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court of, for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. The screech owl also shall rest there, to find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, everyone with her mate. See, the princes shall be nothing because they died in the wrath that was poured out. The place the kingdom was is still there, but it is uninhabitable. This is just a further description of how totally destroyed this area is. Owls in this verse means daughters of screaming. One of the meanings given means a cult. The owl is an unclean bird. Dragons are serpents. This means this place was unfit for anyone except the devil. We do see from the words island and desert that this is not a localized destruction. Verse 16, seek ye out of the book of the Lord. And read, no one of these shall fail. None shall want for her mate, for thy mouth it has commanded, and his spirit, it has gathered them. And I found a verse 17. He hath cast the lot for them. His hand divided it unto them by line, and they shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. See, these vultures have come to clean up the dead carcasses. They live of the dead carcasses. The fact that they that her mate is there shows that there will be plenty to clean up. Dead bodies. God himself commanded the vultures to be there to clean up. This means that every prophecy that Isaiah gave shall come about. Because Isaiah was speaking for God. It's in the book, y'all. God is the one who decides what land belongs to whom. God gave the desolate land to the vultures. Eden would fall never 
to rise again. Wild animals would replace Edom's leaders and the people as its only inhabitants. The same expression is used of the judgment of those who worship the Antichrist during the tribulation. Revelation 14 and 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. A warning. The indignation of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, and the book of the Lord. Let us heed the word of God. Any questions on tonight's teaching, comments, or thoughts, if you're on the conference line, you can now unmute your phone. And those who are in the feed, I'll do my best to try to respond real time to any questions. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? All right, hearing none, let's go on to our questions. Question number one, who is verse one speaking of? The nation. All right, that's very good, the nation. And we want to realize that he was talking to Assyria and also all nations. Very good. Who is the indignation of the Lord upon? All nations. All nations. Very good. All right. In verse number three, the author relates the stink of the carcasses to what? Now, this was kind of structured wrong. But you remember when they said it so bad? Said that uh, people going to have to put stoppers in their nose? Body. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Now, you know that's just a bad smell. But that's what's going to happen when the Lord starts swinging that sword. You just yeah. don't want to be there. Question number four. The heaven shall be rolled up like what? Scroll. That's right, a scroll. Very good. All right, question number five. When did the author relate this time to? When the powers of heaven are shaken. And question six, the fig tree symbolizes what? A whom? I'm sorry. Israel. That's right. Israel. Anytime you see that fig tree, think about Israel. Question seven, what is very important to see in verse number five? Remember it talked about the curse upon his descendants. You know, you can mess up so bad in the spirit that that spiritual judgment can follow your spiritual seed. That's why you got to correct yourself. Demons don't die. They just transfer. But that's why you got to cast them out in the name of Jesus. When you observe certain things, you need to have you a Holy Ghost exorcism. Cast it out. Bind it in the name of Jesus. Because this is all a part of being prepared for God's indignation. All right, where is Idumea? Question eight. In the land of Edom. Very good. In the land of Edom. Very good. Question nine. Who are the people of the curse? Those who disobey God. I want you to know you cursed with a curse when you disobedient to God. And I'm not just talking about tithe or offering of money. I'm talking about when the Lord speaks to you and you reject it. Because the same God that loves you, he's the God that's going to gut you. All right, question number 10. Where is Basra? Very good, Dee. A specific place in Edom. Very good. Question 11. The great judgment on these people is like a blank to God. Sacrifice. Sacrifice. Very good. Question 12. What are, the, what are unicorns in verse 7? Like wild, yeah, wild bulls. That's right. Question 13, 
Why does it appear the land is soaked with blood? Because there's been so much blood that's been shed. You remember, it's, it's just so much. It's going to be like it's just soaked. The day of the Lord's vengeance is the same as what time? The wrath of the Lord. That's right. God said he's going to get you, and trust me, he's going to get you. Question 15. Why is Edom spoken of specifically in these judgments? They refused them. You remember when the children of Israel were coming out of Egyptian bondage? That's why you don't have to worry about vengeance. The Bible said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Just like these Edomites had to pay anybody do you wrong, God got them. You got to bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Because what you don't want to do is let somebody cause you to be judged by God. That's why when we um, meet together on Sunday, for first Sunday, I'm going to say, let a man examine himself. That's why we do this every month, to remind us, it ain't nobody's fault if I don't I don't pick the heaven. It's my fault. I am the one who refuse and reject God. Man. But if you do examine yourself, eat of that bread, drink of that cup. Amen. There's healing and there's deliverance that's made available to us. Cleansing, purifying. But if you eat and drink unworthily, you eat and drink damnation to your own soul. All right, question 16. How does this destruction parallel with the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah? Nobody. Nobody. You can't get by God. I'm telling you. He gonna get every one of you. That's why you got to make sure it's your calling and his election is sure. Because you can't get by God. All right, question 17. How long shall the smoke go up from the destruction? Forever. Forever. That's a perpetual burning. It's going to burn with fire and brimstone, and it shall not be able to be put out. Question 18, how long shall the destroyed land lie waste? Generation to generation. Generation to ever. generation. Ever and ever. ever. Question 19, what will inhabit this desolation? All right, so scavengers will be there. Nothing um, that, that's healthy or right. It just it's, it's just a mess. All right. Question twenty. What is Edom speaking of? Uh, ungodly. Ungodly world. That's right. Ungodly world. That's right. That's why you can't let these ungodly people cause you to act ungodly. Cause see. It's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. All right, closing out here. Question 21. Why will there be no nobles? That's right. They're going to kill them. They, 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 they all died with the wrath was poured out. You ain't going to get away with this. Satan, your kingdom is coming down. Question 22. The owl was a blank bird. It's an unclean bird. Yeah. Unclean. That's right. There's a football team down in Atlanta. Even call themselves the dirty birds. Now you know something wrong with us. Question twenty-three. 
Why will none of these prophecies fail? That's right. It's in the book. You better believe the indignation of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, and the book of the Lord. Whatever's in this book is coming to pass. God is in total control, and he wrote it down to let you know what's going on. Question 24. What do these vultures feed upon? Dead carcasses. Dead carcasses. Uh, that's why I'm thanking God I'm alive. I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him all over me. When you're going to let life make you feel like you don't have nothing to live for, you headed to indignation. All right, question 25. Who allots land to someone or something? God. God. He gives out. Amen. It's a, not a lesson that you're going to hear a lot talk, but it is one that I think is necessary to warn, especially preparing us for Holy Communion. The indignation, yeah. the sword, and the book of the Lord. I pray this teaching tonight has blessed you. It surely blessed me in preparing it. And we're looking forward to go higher in God. And we're going to be meeting yeah. on Sunday. Amen. 10 o'clock for our Sunday school. We're still going to be meeting virtually and also on the conference line, but our morning worship is in person. 12 noon. Hour of Power. 37 Market Street in the city of New Haven, Connecticut. Come on. Join in with us. We would love to have you. I pray God's blessings upon you. Good night. And God bless you. Good night. Good night. God bless you, everybody. It's okay.